So hi everyone, um, welcome, happy Friday. Uh, it's busy today. Uh, so this week we have our good friend, Ian, talking about um, extremal graph theory and the problem of- Zaron Kiewicz. Zaron Kiewicz? Yes. Is he Polish or? Yes. I see. Um, okay, so without further ado, Ian, it's all yours. I'm gonna pass it off to Ian. All right, uh, hello everybody. Um, so, as Nathan just said, today we're going to be talking about um, extremal graph theory and the problem of Zarankevich. Um, I guess the title of this talk is a bit misleading because the problem of Zarankevich is something I'd like to focus on towards the end, but the meat of the talk is going to be on the origins of this, this subject, extremal graph theory. So, get it started. Let's start off with um, just like an abstract going over what this subject is. So extremal combinatorics um, studies the various ways that one can maximize properties of a given structure while obeying certain restrictions that are placed upon it. So for graphs, uh, this primarily amounts to trying to find, given some graph H, the maximum number of edges and a graph G. That does not contain H as a subgraph. So it looks like you all can see that. So we're good. All right. And so just to kind of warm up, make sure everybody's on the same page, um, I'm going to go ahead and just define a graph subgraph and some, some basic uh, notational definitions. Um, so definition um, a graph is a pair of sets. A vertex set V of points, I guess you could call them, or just, you know, heuristically, and edges. So edges are just um, two element subsets of the vertex set. And so, I, I mean, we're all kind of familiar with, with graphs that may look something like this. I don't know. And here we would say if the vertices are A, B, C, D, E, and F, then the edges, the edge set would contain something like A, B, because we have this edge right here, F, E, or E, F because it's a set, so it doesn't matter which order you put it in. But it would not contain something like A, D, because there's no edge between A and D, all right? And um, for any vertex in the vertex set, uh, we define its neighborhood. noted in X to be the set of all vertices such that there's an edge connecting the two. So if we have a vertex X has all these edges coming out of it, these points, you just take the set of these points and that's your neighborhood, right? And um, the degree of X denoted DEG X is just the cardinality of this set. Oh, and I should mention that for the purposes of this talk, we're just gonna be living in a finite world. Um, all these sets are finite, so no Aleph null showing up or anything like that. So, um, and a subgraph, or rather, oh, we say graph H is a subgraph of a graph G. Um, Whenever 
Oh, I should probably VG VG whenever VH subset VG and EH is a subset of EG. And you know, I guess you could say there's sort of an injective correspondence here where you can map edges and vertices into the parent graph um, from the, the bigger graph. So I guess if H looked something like this, this would be, that's not good. This would be a subgraph of a graph that looks something like this. And this edge here does not really matter because we're just focused on these four right here and these four vertices, which map up nicely with H. So it's a subgraph. All right. So um, there are a few tools we're going to use throughout this talk. I'm not going to prove them now, but I'm just going to state them. Um, many of you will already have, be familiar with them, um, at least the, the second two. So the first one is this pretty elementary um, lemma in graph theory called the handshaking lemma. And there, there are two statements. So comprise it. And the first one says, G graph. Then we have the sum of the degrees over all the vertices is the same as twice the number of edges. And you can kind of think about this like saying, um, you know, each, um, the number of vertices or the, sorry, the number of edges of which each vertex is a part will show up in the sum, um, twice. So, um, we'll get the sum of the degrees equals two times the number of edges and the sum of the degree squared all the vertices equals taking the sum over all the edges and summing up the degrees like this. And you can think about this just by saying, okay, well, in this sum here, when you expand it all the way out, this number, degree of x, is going to show of exactly degree of x times um, because there's exactly degree of x edges which contain x. Um, and so when you sum up degree x, degree x times, you get degree x squared. Um, and I should just note, I forgot to say at the beginning, but if anybody has any questions, feel free to just unmute and interrupt. I'm perfectly fine with that. Um, I just want to make sure everything's clear. So, all right. And the second one, the second one of these tools is the Cauchy Schwartz inequality, which I think many of us have seen before, but we're just going to use it in this kind of simpler form, I guess, um, where if A1 and real numbers, then the average of the individual squares is at least the square of the average. So you're summing up all these squares and then dividing by n because there are n of them. So you're taking the average of these, um, these individual squares. And then we're saying that this is at least and you take the full average and then you square the whole thing. We're saying that's it's at least that. Um, and then the last one is the arithmetic mean geometric mean inequality, 
which I think a lot of people see in calculus actually. So this one probably won't be, won't be too bad. Um, but for our purposes, just the purposes of this talk, A1, A2 numbers, then A1 plus A2 over two is at least the square root A1 times A2. So the arithmetic mean of two numbers is at least their geometric mean. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into the first proof we're gonna give. Um, well, first let's do some background. So this was just preparation to talk about the origins of extremal graph theory, as I mentioned in the abstract. And so the origins of this subject lie in um, Mantle's theorem. which gives an answer to the following question. Um, what is the maximum number of edges in an in vertex graph which contains no triangles? And I'm using this sort of informal notation right now. Um, it's not a delta, it's supposed to be a triangle, but I'll make it a little bit more precise later and you'll see why I'm, I'm kind of using this, um, this informal notation. But it just means if we have three vertices, x, y, z, then each one is connected to the other two. So it forms a triangle inside the graph. All right. And it might be better to make this a bit more precise or to give ourselves um, some notation to work with. So um, let's go ahead and say if n is a natural number um, and, oops, and h is a graph, then the extremal number in H is defined to be the maximum size of the edge set Oops. the maximum of the size of the edge set um, such that this is the edge set of n vertex triangle free, or not triangle, n vertex h free graph. And when I say h free, I just mean that uh, this graph G does not contain h as a subgraph. So um, as we mentioned on the first page, um, H would not show up like this inside of the bigger graph G. And we're trying to maximum, maximize the number of edges inside these graphs and find out exactly what it is. So um, in the language, in this language, the question above can be rephrased as determine or what is the value of extremal n triangle. Um, and before we go into the answer that Mantle gave to this question, um, let's try to think of a candidate graph which may approach this maximum number of edges. Um, which is often called the extremal example. Um, and if we can find a good one, it'll give us a nice lower bound to work with. So definition. Um, find the complete bipartite graph. K 
KST to be the graph G where the vertex set is a disjoint union of these two sets, S and T, where S has size S, little s, and T has size little t. Set. Um, such that these two vertices make up an edge if and only if V is an S and T is in T. Oops, not T is in T. U is in T. And um, informally, we can just say the only, um, there are no edges between vertices that are in the same set. So if, if V and U were both in S or both in T, they would not be connected by an edge. And um, in this complete bipartite graph, it means that if V and U are in the two different sets, then they are connected by an edge. So the picture would just look something like this. We have S over here, T over here. We have vertices in S, vertices in T. And everything is connected across. But notice there's no edge between these two vertices or these two vertices or anything in these sets um, because we're trying to keep those well by definition it's just the way the graph is defined and the reason this is important in this context um, is because when s plus t equals n k s t is a triangle free graph and it has a lot of edges. So perhaps it approaches that maximum number that we're trying to reach. And you can see this, um, if we just go up here. Again, if we had some triangle in here, well, if this edge exists, then this one has to be an S and this one has to be in T or vice versa. But then this one, would have to either be an S or T. And if it were an S, this edge couldn't exist. And if it were in T, this edge here couldn't exist. So either way, we don't get any triangles. And there's a lot of edges. Um, and also, we can note that E, the size of E, is maximized on these N vertices. When they're as close, when S and T are as close as you can make them, um, which in this case means S equals the floor of N over two and T equals the ceiling. And this floor and ceiling gets a bit ugly. So we can just say, you know, if N is even, then it's just N over two and N over two. And the way we can count the edges in this graph is by saying, okay, well, for each vertex here in S, oops, that was not supposed to happen. Uh, for each vertex in S. There's an undo button. Oh, okay. Nice. Okay, so for each vertex in S, it's connected to everything in T and vice versa for T. So if we just wanted to count over the vertices in S, um, it turns out that you just multiply these two numbers together and that's the number of edges in this graph. So it comes out to be roughly n squared over four. All right. And so I guess, well, as I mentioned earlier, this gives us a lower bound on the maximum number of edges because this graph doesn't contain any triangles. So the max, a graph with the maximum number of edges not containing triangles would have to do better than this. Um, or at least meet it. And so when, now, now we can say that X in is at least N over two times N over two. Um, and the natural question is, K 
can one do better? And Mantle's answer to this question was no. This is the best you can do. And um, I guess the, the sort of classical proof of this that we're gonna go ahead and do right now is, I think it's very beautiful. So, um, um, and as we said above, he determined the exact value of this extremal number to be. And so let's prove it. Um, let G be an invertex triangle free graph. And the key observation in this proof is that if we have this edge between vertices X and Y, then X and Y have no common neighbors. And by that, I simply mean that their neighborhoods are disjoint. Because if we had this X, Y edge here, and they did have a common neighbor, some Z that was connected to both of them, we would immediately get a triangle in the graph. And we are assuming that this graph does not have it. So as such, we have that, and this is, this is just a bridge identity on finite sets. So the union of two sets, the size of the union is the same as the size of one set plus the size of the other set minus their intersection. Oh, and of course here we're still assuming that X and Y are connected by an edge. Um, but since this quantity we just determined to be zero, we can say that this union here is the neighborhood of X, the size, plus the size of the neighborhood of Y, which by definition is just the sum of their degrees. Um, now, the union of the two neighborhoods has to be less than or equal to the size of the entire vertex set, because it wouldn't make sense for their combined neighborhood to have more vertices in it than the entire graph has in it. Um, and so since this is equal to this, we have that for any um, X and Y connected by an edge, the sum of their degrees is less than or equal to N. And so, using this identity here, we can sum over all edges, x, y, the degree of x, the degree of y. Um, and this sum is going to be less than or equal to sum once again over all edges but this time in, because you can think about it like replacing this, each term in this sum by n, because n is greater than or equal to all of these terms here. All right. And since now um, the argument in this summation does not depend on the edges, it's simply n summed up the number of edges times and so this quantity is equal to n times the size of e. But on the other hand, we can 
pull out our friend, the handshaking lemma and say, okay, well, some of the degrees or all the edges. is the same thing by this handshake lemma as the sum of the individual degrees squared over all the vertices in B. And then I uh, recall that Cauchy Schwartz says that the sum, the average of the squares is greater than or equal to the square of the average. And if we pull this one over n out, it's going to be one over n squared. So if we canceled one over n on both sides, we would be left with uh, simply the sum of the squares is greater than or equal to one over n times the square of the sum. And so here we can use this, um, this identity to say that this is greater than one over V because there are V terms in the sum times the square of the sum, right? And then invoking the handshaking lemma once more, the first statement in it, we have that this equals here, one over V times uh, two times the number of edges squared. And since this is an invertex set, the size of V is just N. And so we are left with four E squared over N. And recall that before we had determined that the sum of these degrees was less than or equal to n, over n times e. And here we have that the sum of these degrees is greater than or equal to 4e squared over n. So combining these, we find that 4 size of e squared over n is less than or equal to n times the size of the edge set. And rearranging this equation, we get that the size of the edge set is less than or equal to n squared over four, which is exactly the bound that we seek on the number of edges when n is even. And when n is odd, you can do some, some fiddling with um, these floors and ceilings, but it, it comes out to be the same thing. Um, so I have a question. Go ahead. Is it the um, unique maximizer, I guess? Um, so well, are there other graphs which do the same thing that are nice more? Well, it's actually interesting that you would ask that question because this proof only tells us that the, uh, the extremal number of the edges of triangle free graphs equals n squared over four, roughly. But it doesn't tell us what this graph looks like. And for that, we can go ahead and do another proof of it that might tell us some more information about the structure of G. And so your question will be answered with this. Proof. So we're going to do another proof. Oh, his question was whether this is the unique graph which contains this um, th that um, complete bipartite graph, whether that was the unique graph attaining this maximum. And so for that, we're going to go ahead and do another proof. And so once more, Oh, before I continue, does anybody have any questions about the previous proof? Okay, cool. All right, so for this one, um, I'm going to once more let G be an invertex triangle free graph. And this time we're going to make uh, another key observation. So, um, for each vertex, the 
the neighborhood of X is an independent set. And by that, I simply mean that if Y and Z are both neighbors of X, so X is connected to both of them, then there cannot be an edge between Y and Z. And to see this, take a vertex X, take its neighborhood, and you have all these points in here. And if there were some Y here and some Z here, and they had an edge between them, well, they're in the neighborhood of X, which means there's an edge between each of them and X. And so we would immediately get a triangle in our graph. And so once more, since we're assuming that this graph does not have any triangles in it, um, this cannot happen. And so uh, the neighborhood of every vertex has to be an independent set. So since we're living in a finite world, we can fix a largest independent set in the graph. And once again, here, I just mean that um, it's the largest size set in the graph, such that of uh, vertices, such that there is no edge between any two of them. So fix a largest set A. And also I should just say that it doesn't have to be, there doesn't have to be one unique largest set, um, but just take a largest independent set. And then set A of vertices. And let B be the rest of the, ver the vertices in the graph. So on the one hand, well, if we sum over all the, if we sum the degrees of each vertex in B, then by the handshaking lemma, sort of, this is going to be, I'm gonna use some notation here, but I, I think it'll be kind of intuitive what it means and I'll explain. Um, it'll be the number of edges going between A and B, right? Plus number of edges contain, or plus twice the number of edges contained entirely in B. And to see this, you can just say, okay, well, if we're summing over the degrees of all the vertices in B, each edge that goes into A will be counted once because B is the complement of A. And each edge that lies entirely within B will be counted twice because we're gonna, gonna count it for the first vertex in the edge and the second vertex in the edge. And this quantity, is simply the number of edges in G plus the edges inside B. And you can think of this um, because, you can think about it because A is independent. So there are no edges inside A. So all the edges in the graph are either inside B or they go between B and A. And since we have two, we're counting each of these twice, we have this uh, leftover term here when we combine the edges inside B and the edges between B and A. All right. And so on the other hand, this observation, this key observation we have up here, tells us that for all B and B, the degree of B, which is the size of the neighborhood of B, is less than or equal to A. Because the neighborhood of all these vertices will have to be an independent set by our observation. And A was assumed to be the largest sized independent set of vertices in the graph. Okay. And therefore, 
we have that the sum of these degrees in B. is less than or equal to, once more summing over the vertices in B, the size of A, um, because once more, you're just replacing each term in this sum by something greater than or equal to it. So follows. And again, since A, the size of A does not depend on any of these vertices, this is simply the size of A times the size of B, because there are B vertices we're summing, size of B vertices that we're summing over. And recall that the arithmetic mean geometric mean inequality says that A1 plus A2 over two is greater than or equal to the square root of A1, A2, which is the same thing as saying that A1 plus A2 squared or over two quantity squared is greater than or equal to the product. So here we have a product of A and B, and this arithmetic mean geometric mean inequality tells us that this is less than or equal to the size of A plus the size of B over two quantity squared. All right. And the A and B, B is the complement of A, recall. So when we add up their cardinalities, it's just going to be the size of the entire vertex set. And that is n. And so we get n squared over four. And so now it follows that um, because the degree over here was equal to the size of e, the size of e plus the number of edges contained entirely within b. Oops. Well, first, let's just say, because the number of edges in B is at least zero, we have that the size of E is less than or equal to the size of E plus number of edges in B. All right, because it's a positive number or zero. Um, and over here, we said that this was equal to the degree, but then of all the sum of these degrees. And then down here, we said that the same sum of these degrees in B was less than or equal to n squared over four. And so combining these two inequalities, or these two, uh, these two chains of equalities and inequalities, I guess, we get that the size of E is less than or equal to n squared over four. And once more, um, you know, if, if n is even, this is exactly what we're looking for. And if n is odd, you can do some fiddling with floors and ceilings, but it comes out to be the same bound that we were looking for. And so going back to Nathan's question, what, what more does this proof tell us about the structure of G, what G looks like? Well, assuming that G achieves um, this extremal number. Um, we know that because um, n over two times the ceiling of n over two is greater than or equal to n squared minus one over four, which if you just expand the numbers out um, and consider the cases when it's odd or even, it follows. Um, and this is equal to 7.25. Uh, because of this, um, the above lines are going to tell us that n squared over 4 minus 0 0.25 plus the number of edges side B is less than or equal to the size of E um, because the size, since we assume that G achieves this extremal number, the size of E will be this, and it's greater than or equal to this quantity here, as we just said over here, um, plus the 
edges contained in Tarlene B. And um, this is just, as we you know, went over above, the sum of the degrees in V. And as we said earlier, in those above inequalities, this is the same as sum over, or, or it's less than or equal to the sum over all vertices in B with the size of A. You pull that out, you get A times B, less than or equal to plus B over two squared, which equals N squared over four. But now we have that N squared over four minus 0 0.25 plus the edges contained in B is less than or equal to N squared over four. And what this tells us is that the size of the edge set inside B um, is less than or equal to 0 0.25. And since it's an integer, this means that there are no edges inside B. OK, well, what does this mean? This means that B is also an independent set. So A, B are now both independent sets. So there are no edges going between the two vertices or between two vertices in A or two vertices in B, right? And we assume that G achieves this um, extremal number. So we want the size of A, the distance between the size of A and the size of B to be as small as possible. Because if A were much, much bigger than B, um, we could simply take a vertex in A, move it over into B, and connecting all of them here um, would yield more edges in the graph. And so then it wouldn't achieve the extremal number if the size was way bigger over here than here. And similarly, um, if this graph were not the complete bipartite graph between A and B, then we could just add in more edges and increase the edge count and therefore it would not achieve the maximum either. So one can see then that up to isomorphism, the unique graph achieving this extremal number on triangles is the complete bipartite graph on the floor and ceiling of n over two vertices. Again, this floor and ceiling, you don't have to worry about it too much. We're just trying to make them, these two sets, their sizes to be as close as possible. Um, and we have to account for when it's odd because then n over two would not be an integer. So does anybody have any questions? About the proof or? Um, yeah, yeah. just both. No, so if I wanted to do, so the question you sort of posed a page ago, I think, um, let me go back, maybe it was two pages ago, um, maybe two pages, it's one more page. Uh, what is the value of X and maybe not Delta, but H, so I pick different subgraph. Um, okay, well, we're actually about to talk about that. Okay, so now, so, yeah. um, <laughs> you're anticipating all the, all the right, or you're asking all the right questions. So, okay. So as Nathan just said, um, or asked, um, a natural thing to wonder would be what is the value of X and H when H is an arbitrary graph? And this is one of the most studied problems in all of extremal graph theory. Um, and a solution to it for, the, for almost all graphs is given in a theorem called the Erdős stone. Some people like to include Shimonovich. Shimonovich. 
which um, yeah. and we'll talk more about that later. So the next thing I'd like to talk about are generalizations of Mantle's theorem. So just to remind us, Mantle's theorem says that the extremal number here is given by n over two, n over two. And this is uniquely achieved by the complete by perfect set graph. Two and over two. We're ending at one thirty today, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Speaking at one thirty. Okay. Um, so I'm definitely not going to finish today. So I guess I'll um, maybe I'll finish this next week. But um, I want to go ahead and talk about the different generalizations of Mantle's theorem that people have tried to um, that people have examined ever since it. Um, was first considered, I guess. So the, the two main different ways you can look at, look to generalize Mantle's theorem kind of depend on how you want to view this triangle. So on the one hand, this triangle is a clique on three vertices. And what that means is that you take these three vertices and you um, connect all possible edges. So for example, a clique on five vertices would connect every vertex here to every other vertex in the graph. This is K5. And similarly, well, I guess the other direction one could try to take this problem is by looking at the triangle as a cycle, which is a node by C3. And instead of having every vertex connected to every other vertex, it means you sort of cycle through these um, every vertex, but each vertex only has two neighbors. So looking at five vertices, the cycle C5, look like this. So you're just cycling through the vertices, I guess, is, is the way one might think about it. So this direction up here, generalizing Mantle's theorem for arbitrary cliques, was actually quite successful. And um, there was a mathematician named Paul Turan, Hungarian mathematician who determined the exact number, um, the exact extremal number um, for a graph on invertices forbidding a clique of size L. And furthermore, he came up with a unique graph called the Turan graph. which achieves um, this construction, or that which achieves this, um, this maximum number of edges. Um, and this was done in 1941. And on the other hand, when people tried to look at cycles, um, this problem turned out to be to be much much harder. Um, so when L is even, um, has turned out to be a very very challenging problem. There are few known sharp bounds on this value.
and it is 123 now. So I think that's where we'll pick up next week. Um, we're going over talking about the difference between um, these two these two extensions of Mantel's theorem, and uh, I guess just considering why one is so much more difficult than the other. So, does anybody have any questions in general or about this or anything? I have one or two, unless other people have questions. Sure, go ahead. So, in the case where it's odd, is it no? Or is it an easier problem for this second? It is. And um, I can actually talk about that real quick. So um, Turan's theorem, not only does it extend Mantle's theorem in a very natural seeming way, but it, it's actually one of the, it, this Erdős stone theorem up here can actually be seen almost in a certain sense as a corollary of, of Turan's theorem. And the Erdős Stone theorem determines almost exactly the value of H when the chromatic number of H is greater than or equal to three. Um, almost exactly. And the chromatic number, just to define this real quick, is one can think of it as the least number of colors that one needs to color the vertices of a graph so that no two um, adjacent vertices have the same color. So for example, when um, if we have an odd cycle, so like C5, for example, we could color it like this, white and black. Um, but we can never, there's no way to color it with just two colors because you're always going to get these two adjacent vertices down here um, that have the same color. So you need at least three to, to give a um, what's called a proper coloring of C5 or CL for any um, odd number L. And so therefore we can use this Erdős Stone theorem to pretty much to give an almost exact um, answer for this for this number. So okay. but when L is even, so like for example C6, um, you can easily color C6 with two colors because you would just alternate like this. And since it's even, it would come back like that. And we'll talk more about why the Erdős Stone theorem doesn't really help us with this next time, but um, it doesn't give a very informative answer, I guess you could say, when the chromatic number is two. Okay, any other questions? Well, I have more, but um, maybe I'll postpone them until later because you're going to talk about this again next week. Okay. So I have more time to think. <laughs> sure. Um, well, if that's it, then I don't think I have anything more to say this week, but I'll be continuing next week with um, with these two these two generalizations and talking about why one is much harder than the other. So, yeah. so let's thank our speaker. Thank you. And if there are no further questions, then um, we'll, we'll call it a day. There's a couple other things going on today. There's two more uh, thesis defenses and then an analysis seminar. So um, I guess see you guys next week. Uh, it'll be fun. This was a fun talk. So thanks again for speaking. And uh, yeah, see everybody next week.